Well, you don't remember a lot when you're four years old, but uh, I do have certain vivid memories, and uh, you know, one of them was um, uh, you know, waking up to the sirens when, when bombers were coming in. I can still hear the drone of bombers, and you know, if, if, a, if a siren comes on now, I, can, I still sort of give a little uh, shudder. Um, and I remember you know, playing around in the, amongst the war debris and bits of broken bombs and things sticking around. And I remember the journey out of Germany, was when we got out of Germany, came back to England with my mother and brother. And uh, I remember you know, vividly driving in a jeep, you know, being driven in a jeep by some you know, soldiers through the Ardennes. And uh, yeah, there were there were just uh, hundreds of burnt out tanks and things which he was just driving around, and uh, yeah, so it was uh, a few vivid memories. Yeah, and then arriving back in England, it, which seemed like a totally different land, you know, different different universe. I was always sort of interested in the outdoors, and uh, I was a very keen bird watcher, and, uh, and uh, I had a I. My first sort of expedition on my own was to the to the Cairngorms, uh, walking over the Cairngorms and you know, bird watching there, and then, and so I, you know, I had a sort of love for the outdoors, and uh, but I was, was I was just told that uh, you know, bird watching was great, but I just wanted a little bit more excitement, something a little bit more excitement, and uh, it was when I was coming back from my Cairngorm holiday that uh, I, I thumb, was thumbing through a, a youth hostel magazine. And uh, there were some pictures of people climbing on the local sandstone rocks near Tunbridge Wells. So I thought, oh, well, that's interesting. Uh, climbing there, I'll, I'll have a look and uh, see what's see if, you know, see what's happening. So I went one weekend and um, met some climbers there. Uh, and uh, sort of begged, begged at the end of a rope, and uh, I found, uh, you yeah, know, that uh, to my delight, I was, uh, you know had a facility for it and, you know, and really enjoyed it and so that was the end of it and never stopped after that. <laughs> it was basically all I had to climb on for quite a long time because uh, getting away to uh, you know, Wales Peak District or whatever, wherever was, it was, it was pretty difficult in those days but so um, I mean I, I, I just, uh, just Loved it, and um, I still do actually. Uh, I, I, was, I really, really enjoy going back to it, and uh, I've popped back every now and then on odd occasions, and and once or twice, you know, done one or two terrific routes. Which, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I was talking to Rab the other day, and he said, oh, you, you must mention about uh, Crateret. He said it's yeah, one of the one of the one of the great, great uh, outcrop routes, you know, and, uh, and uh, so yeah. True, uh, uh, there are some fantastically good, good bits of climbing there, which uh, you know there's hold a, hold up to anywhere really. I did quite a lot of decent routes really, no, nothing, no, no, no sort of um, you know, mind blowing routes or anything. But uh, at the time they were, they were, they were, they were quite hard, you know, and um, and people tend to tend to forget the. The awful gear we had in those days, you know, and we, I mean, I was still threading, threading slings around pebbles and putting, you know, inserting pebbles in cracks rather than having a decent rack of nuts, which, um, you know, has made life so much, so different, so easy, so much easier, you know. It's a, so, um, you know, the routes we did on them, you know, Mott and the, uh, had good times doing those, and uh, had, uh, and the. Uh, I remember particularly um, a good spell of where I climbed with Dave Alcock, um, where we um, did quite a lot of really, really good routes on um, on Suicide Wall, which um, which were fantastic. And uh, once again, you know, we were doing it. We were climbing from the ground upwards, not cleaning routes. Um, and uh, so, you know, you uh, inevitably you are using a little bit of aid sometimes just to. Of putting a nut in or something and hanging on it and just just to clean the rock ahead of you, uh, you know. We didn't uh, uh, nowadays, of course. You'd you'd ab the ab down, clean everything thoroughly, and then climb it, which no doubt would be a, a, achieve a better end. But uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, it was a little bit more adventurous climbing 
from the ground upwards. Good memories, yeah, I had lots of good memories, but also lots of bad memories as well. I mean, I was, uh, it was a, I never had, uh, uh, I never really had any sort of permanent climbing um, relationships. So they were sort of, you know, just the odd climbing for a few, few days with someone and then someone else. And so it was always, uh, I missed out on a lot of opportunities when, when uh, you know, I felt that I, I could have been climbing and I just had, had no one to climb with, no, no partner really. So I remember being quite frustrated then. And, and then I also had, I remember a bad, bad time when I had uh, um, glandular fever and that really knocked, knocked me down for a long time. So, uh, but the good times, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, the good times were um, in really, you know, 1959 was the sort of when it's sort of really one of the best memories when when you know it opened out all the the the, the, the sort of the hard climbing of the day, the Joe Brown, Don Willans routes and things were were were. were being climbed for the first time, and you know, you could say, "Well, I have to do the third, the fourth ascent of this and that and the other." You know, were, there were that few ascents in those days, and it was it was a very exciting time when you felt that you were breaking into the scene, really. Yeah. Well, we were we were, we were staggered, really, that such a such a, a huge uh, crag with uh, you know with obvious features and lines like that had, had, had remained. Um, Undiscovered, uh, I mean, and uh, you could hardly believe it, really. Um, uh, first, we thought, well, the rock must be terrible or something, and uh, uh, to some extent, uh, the route we chose first to do uh, proved the point that it was pretty bad. But uh, that was it was a super, superficial uh, looseness, which, um, in fact, uh, you know, was, was untrue. You know, we found out later that uh, the rock is basically sound and. Uh, Provided superb climbing, but uh, I mean, we were we were we were utterly gobsmacked when we sort of peered over the edge and saw it for the first time, and scrambled down with quite with difficulty <laughs> to because there was no, no path or anything in those days, and uh, we managed to get down to the, the, the to, to the sea level, and the tide was out, and we we scrambled out to some little little scurries. Uh, Way back so to have a, to to view the crag, and uh, it was you know we just you know, thought, blimey, you know, there's there's bags of climbing to be done here. <laughs> I think it was much more a natural progression in those days. You know, the uh, one always um, you know, uh, rock climbing, uh, alpine, alpine, you know, dolomites first, usually then then the Western Alps, a bit of snow and ice, crampons. Ice axes, and then you know the uh, the the greater ranges, you know the Himalayas and Andes and things were like were, were sort of the um, the ultimate uh, aim really, and uh, and I was quite happy to follow in that uh, that line. <laughs> One of our early routes before we did the Banati, we went on to the Crocodile uh, East East Ridge, and uh, we. Uh, we bumped into um, Lionel Terry, who was guiding uh, a, a client up it, and, uh, and he first of all uh, was seeing me sort of these usual, usual ragged English people who haven't got much clue in the arts, generally speaking, and he sort of warned us, I don't mind you climbing, but do not get in my way, please, sir. I am with, the, uh, with my guide, and so we, we reverently nodded and Kept, kept behind, and um, eventually he, uh, he he went off and he, he went completely off route, and he was sort of he was dragging himself up some hideous overhang, and uh, and uh, they said, he, uh, I said to my, he said to Clive, and uh, he's he's nowhere near the route, so we so we slipped by, and uh, and he eventually realised he was off route and abseil down and by that time there was a fun monumental storm blew up and we realised that uh, it was really you know, quite dangerous and so uh, we left some etrias and left a rope uh, for him to get down so that he could get off the mountain quickly from this electrical storm and he was um, he was extremely grateful for that and uh, and uh, actually made a, a you know made a, 
made appeared in the in the in the, in the national cafe, which uh, which no no respectable Frenchman ever did in those days, and uh, and uh, returned our rope and, and thanked us for uh, our thoughtfulness. So we were we felt very chuffed. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, it's always it's been my sort of dream to, to climb in the Himalayas. You know, they are read all the literature and you know, all these fire expeditions going into these you know, remote areas with great you know, long marchings and through jungles and God knows what. And so I was you know, really quite excited at the thought of going to the Himalayas. And, um, Having climbed with Chris a lot and being a friend with him, uh, yeah, uh, eventually when uh, expeditions to the Himalayas became a possibility after a long period when they were forbidden because of uh, wars and political problems, uh, I was in the right place and we were knowing the right people and, uh, and uh, yeah, had the immense excitement of, uh, of going to um, Annapurna, which uh, Annapurna South Face, uh, attempting you know, what was at the time, you know, the first time attempting a, to climb a mountain which had already been climbed by the French, that's all going to go, uh, climbing a, a, a mountain by its face, by one of the harder routes on it. And uh, yeah, that was a, a sort of quite a, a breakthrough at the time. And it was, a, you know, it was, the whole thing was just immensely exciting for me. I mean, I, uh, you know, just, Kathmandu and then uh, walking in long, long walk in through, through you know wild areas and uh, there was uh, no tea houses or anything in those days, no tea shacks. It was, it was uh, you know camping in the in the jungle. Um, so it was uh, it was it was fantastic. And then the actual you know the climbing was uh, once again it was, uh, uh, it was just an eye you know marvelous eye-opening experience for me really. The day we set off, uh, the four of us, uh, uh, Pete Boardman, uh, Per Temba, um, myself and uh, Mick Burke. Uh, Mick Burke was, uh, was the, sort of the cameraman and he, uh, he was carrying heavy, heavy, you know, quite heavy film kit. And um, I, I'd been I'd been feeling really very very fit and lively up to that point. Uh, and uh, but when I set out in the morning from a camp, all of a sudden I just could hardly put one foot in front of the other. I was uh, couldn't understand what the hell was going on. We had os oxygen sets on, and uh, I sort of I got out. I went out in front, anticipating you know, taking the lead, and. Um, I, uh, I just basically felt completely at sea and, uh, and eventually a crampon fell off and, uh, and, uh, and I sort of had to stop and, and uh, at that point I realised that yeah, something was wrong here and my oxygen set just wasn't delivering any oxygen and I was uh, carrying some of those 30 pounds of bloody useless equipment on my back, so it's no wonder I was struggling. And uh, so I went back to the tent whilst the others went on. And uh, Mick Burke was a little bit slower than the others, who was carrying a bit more equipment. But I sort of popped my head out and looked to see that could see them slowly going up to the summit. And, uh, and then I thought, well, that's it. And then yeah, then the, uh, the, the sort of the tragedy really, slowly the weather started deteriorating, wind started blowing, clouds started coming in and, and uh, I realised that they were, yeah, they were going to have a, have a bad time getting back. And uh, sure enough, uh, yeah, that was when um, Pete and Potemba got to the summit, got back, uh, got, got, got Back to the South Col and uh, met uh, met little Mick still slowly plodding upwards, and uh, they said they would wait for him, and uh, they waited as long as they could, and uh, you know he didn't come back, and uh, they eventually struggled back down, and uh, little Mick never never did come back. So what happened, we'll never know. 
but it was a, it was a you know, pretty nightmarish scenario. You know, I, you know, I realized that uh, you know, as the night went on, uh, eventually Pete and Potemba sort of came back in a bad bad state. You know, they were obviously it's had a bad struggle through the through the storm. And uh, they installed them in the tent, and they uh, brewed up for them, and sort of basically looked after them. But uh, all the time, I thought, well, you know, is Mick going to make it? And I thought, I don't know whether he will or not. And you know, as the night progressed, I realised that he wouldn't. You know, it was unlikely that he would ever come back. And so that was the first thing, and then. Once I realised that he wouldn't come back, it was a started to think, well, you know, uh, how are we going to get out of it ourselves? And, uh, you know, it was a pretty, pretty awful state. The, the snow battering, the, the, the tents were being slowly crushed with the accumulating snow. We were running out of fuel, running out of food, and thought, well, I'm, and I was getting just slowly weaker and weaker. You could feel it. You know, just just ex just surviving at uh, you know twenty seven thousand feet was not easy. So when eventually the storm did break, we realised that you know that was our chance to escape. And uh, I uh, you know had a hard old hard job battering out and battering out the thick ropes and clearing the thick ropes. To so you know we could descend, and it was in during that period that I, I sort of got quite bad frostbite in my fingers, and, but uh, you know eventually made it down, and that was that was it. So the the end of expedition. A uh, very long time actually, um, thirty years or so, maybe even a bit longer. Um, in you know, the periods of. Uh, when I was uh, expeditioning, not uh, not teaching, I, you know, I thought, you know, thought I'd better put my my leisure leisure time to some use and perhaps uh, you know, write a write an autobiography. So I started in that period, and uh, and uh, I got quite keen on it at first, and then and then it faltered, and then I sort of lost interest basically, and. Uh, it was only in the last few years when uh, I once again had, uh, had time on my hands. I thought, well, it's about time I actually finished the damn thing. You know, a few people had, who had read it, early chapters kept sort of nagging me, said, well, why, why don't you finish it? You know, like, you know, Jim Curran was one who uh, said, yeah, well, you should ought to, ought to finish it. And I thought, well, I don't know, perhaps I ought to. And, and it was basically, uh, I found someone who could, uh, who was willing to type up my uh, my illegible scripts, and uh, uh, once I'd found someone to do that, I thought I was encouraged to to carry on and get the thing done. So, and finally, I'm I'm pleased I had done. You know, it was a, it was a bit of a sort of millstone around my neck for ages. I felt uh, totally guilty not not get the damn thing thing finished. Yeah, I mean it's. Um, I've been climbing now for, for fifty, over fifty years, and uh, in that time, I've uh, seen a lot, hell of a lot of changes, and uh, climbed with uh, you know vast numbers of different people, and uh, that, that's been one of the great joys of climbing is actually meeting all these people, and uh, you know, and uh, going all over the show, climbing different different things and different rocks, different places, you know, America, and Australia, South Africa, you know. I mean, it's quite interesting talking to people in, in America. You know, they say, hey, have you climbed there? So we say, yeah, yeah, we've climbed there. We, we've, Rap and I have probably climbed in more places in America than most, most Americans, you know. It's, 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 it's fantastic to think of all the places we have been to. And I just love it. And, you know, climbing has changed a hell of a lot. But, in essence, it's the same. You know, it's, it's, you, you're on a boulder problem 50 years ago or 
tomorrow, you know, it's exactly the same, and uh, you know, the, and the joy you get from it is, is just the same, and it's 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 it's, you know, moving moving well over a bit of rock is still gives me the same excitement as it did, you know, fifty years ago.